I had made this giant monster in my head of what I owed. Okay. Yeah. In my head, I owed everyone a million bajillion and quadrillion dollars. Yep. <laughs> you were never going to get out from under it. It was never. so I'm Maxie McCoy, and this has never been asked where I invite my guests to break out of whatever box they have been put into. And my next guest is going to get us thinking differently about our dollars. While money is a part of the fabric of our existence, it's also something that we don't ask about enough. And that is going to change today. So please join me in welcoming personal finance expert, Dominique Broadway. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Maxie. I'm so happy you're here because girl, let me tell you, this is a topic that I have wanted to talk about on this show for a long while, and we are going to do that with you. And it's also something that we've gotten a lot of questions about from our community about this topic. And I'm actually going to be asking you those throughout. So all, all of our listeners know that their questions are, are getting in, but This is also because money is obviously so personal to each of us. It's so ingrained in our hour by hour life, whether we're paying attention to that or not. It's also really hard to take a step back and get above it to think about our relationship to money, right? Our relationship to wealth, our relationship to the power and the social justice justice issues that we have to look beyond in order to see what's there. And I'm just delighted to talk to you about all of it. But first, Dominique, I want to know what you've never been asked. Mm, there's there's probably a lot, but <laughs> I would say one of the, one of the things that I'm always kind of surprised a lot of times in, in, in these different types of interviews is no one will necessarily ask you about my own personal finance journey, right? They're like, just give us tips, you know, give us the top three budgeting tips or whatever. Give me those takeaways. Yeah. <laughs> don't tell me how you got like, them. What did you, how did you learn or, or what, how, you know, what financial struggles did you deal with? If any, cause I think they just kind of assume that you're a personal finance expert. So you've always had to figure it out since birth. Yeah. Um, so I would say that's probably one thing I'm never necessarily asked. About. Well, I want to know then I want to know what was the journey that led you to getting to this expertise challenges included? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say just even as a, a child in my family, we talked about money all the time like all the time. So I think that has helped, or I know it has helped me uh, now to be able to openly have these conversations. Um, But as a child, like I said, I would literally sit down. I always knew how much money my mom made. um, And my grandparents would share their information with me as well. And I would sit down and help her pay the bills every month. So I was very a part of the conversation. I knew that money didn't just grow on trees, right? I knew um, that money came in, we had to use it to pay bills, whatever it may be, right? I was, so that was that was like kind of the beginning for me. Um, so I was always just really good with money. My mom was, uh, she didn't go to college, but she was an accountant. Um, so she was also really good with money as well. And then as I got older, just having these conversations with money, I realized how important it was in our lives, not from a greed aspect, but I understood that money equated to freedom, right? Equated to freedom, being able to do what you wanted to do, being able to live the lifestyle that you wanted on your own terms. Um, and I realized really young, you know, when you're a kid, you know, when you go to the store with your mom, they're like, or your parents or whoever, they're just like, when you go in this store, don't touch anything. You're like, why'd you bring me, right? <laughs> don't ask for anything, don't touch anything. And so I realized really early, like, I gotta have my own money. Cause if I go in this, store, she won't walk me around this store and I want something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. I need to have yeah. my own money. So I understood, you know, the power of just making my own money and starting, you know, when I was like seven years old making bracelets and had a lot of different businesses throughout, um, throughout, um, throughout my childhood and even through college, yeah. uh, starting different businesses, became like the CEO of a company when I was like 15, like just always been Love on it. it. Yeah. Um, but I just realized, you know, that I wanted to, to, to learn about the stock market. I taught myself how to invest, um, you know, became a licensed financial advisor, was always doing things perfectly, bought my first house at 22 and then had this itch that a lot of entrepreneurs get that I was supposed to be doing something else, but I didn't know what it was and ended up quitting my job, starting my business. And that's when I started having the other side of the financial journey. Like yeah. a lot of entrepreneurs didn't, I wasn't, I didn't, uh, didn't price myself well. I didn't account for all the things that had to go into 
the pricing and things that nature. And I ended up um, in my late twenties being basically dead broke. Uh, car was repossessed. My house went into foreclosure. I got all of it back, right? Yeah. So I'm a great negotiator. <laughs> I got yeah. all of it back, awesome. but I had that other side of financial. Well, it's interesting, right? Having that other side, it was almost like you were, you had learned the expertise around the work and then you were putting the work into action. Yes. Um, even though, you know, there were, there were struggles involved. What do you think, like when you look back at that time, and I'm sure it's embedded in the way that all of our journeys are into the yeah. work that we mm-hmm. do, but when you look back on that hard time and that struggle, what was happening there? It was a lot. It was a lot happening, Maxie. And that, that's a great question. It was a lot of mental, mm-hmm. a lot of mental. So I was battling and, you know, I'm not sure if, you know, people, if you if your listeners are spiritual or not, but I was battling because I knew that the reason why I had quit my job was because God was leading me to a greater purpose. I knew it. And so I was battling with that because I knew that this is what I was supposed to be doing, but I couldn't understand why I still wasn't making the money that I needed to yeah. really survive, to be honest, right? Yeah. I knew all my bills. But even though I knew what I was supposed to be doing financially, the entrepreneur in me was just like, it's okay. I'll just make more money next month and I'll fix all this. I'll just make more money next month and I'll fix all this. And month after month after month, that wasn't the case. Mm-hmm. But it was, it was, it was like the entrepreneur in me that was super ambitious that was saying, I can fix this, I can fix this. But a lot of times we can't, right? Yeah. And I needed to take a step back. And what I ended up having to do, you know, when you know stuff really hit the fan, right? Yeah. Yeah. Our business, house getting going into foreclosure, got behind my condo fees, like everyone yeah. is like phone is blowing up, you know, can't pay this, can't pay that. Robin Peter. So much anxiety too. So much anxiety. And I had to, um, what I had to do. And it was interesting because I was, I was still working with clients and they were thriving. Right. So I knew what to do and how to help everyone. I just couldn't help myself. Self. Because a lot of times when you are expert or, or know this certain stuff, you don't necessarily take the time to get yourself where you need to be. So I had to like, literally I had to call my grandfather who I feel like my original, the original financial planner in my life. And I was just like, I have screwed myself over. I need help. Not much financial help. I just need help mentally breaking through this. I went yeah. to his house. I brought all of my mail because as what, well, I don't know very else, but what I did, when I got in this situation, I did not open my mail. I wouldn't answer the phone because I was completely avoiding it. I know that feeling like you just get avoidant, whether it's a relational issue, a money, like your relationship to anything. And instead of just cleaning the house up, you're just like, if I don't pay attention to it, it's not there. It'll go away. And that's, and it won't, it only gets worse. I went to his house and pulled out all these letters and he's like, what is all this? I'm like, this is the letters I've been getting. I've just been avoiding them. Yeah. We're just going to open them up one by one. And it's literally interesting because this is what I used to do with my clients. He was literally took me through the same process. I would open up every single letter and I we, we laid them out. We put them in order. We made a list of everything that I owed. And this is a funny thing, Maxie. And I think a lot of your listeners will probably relate to this. I had made this giant monster in my head of what I owed. Okay. Yeah. In my head, I owed everyone a million bajillion, quadrillion dollars. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> you were never going to get out from under it. It never. was so yeah. And it was funny when we added it up, it was like... It's like fifteen thousand dollars or something like that. Like it, it, you know, which it which is which is still a lot. Real but money, was, but not not money that you you know you're making that in a day now. Yeah, oh yeah, a lot more than that. But you get yeah. what I'm saying, right? But even then, it was just like my grandpa was like, "This is it," and I'm like, "Yes," and he's like, "Dominique, stop!" Like cut it. And we just sat down and we called every single bill collector and we sat down and we did my budget based on what we're bringing in. Like, look, this is what I can afford to pay. If it's $50 a month, a hundred dollars yeah. negotiated with everyone, got all that stuff fixed. It took me a while. It took me a few years to get my credit clean back yeah. up. My credit had went down to like 430 or something. Yeah. Um, from at the time when, when 750 was like the highest of back in the day, um, my score was like a 730 and it mm-hmm. went, it fell down to like a 430. So in the moment, I didn't understand why I was going through all of that. But now that I look back, I realize I feel like I know that God would really want me to be educated in different areas. So then I wasn't just able to help people with building wealth and investing because that's something that I truly was an expert at. I couldn't implement it in my own life because I'd have wealth, right? Yeah. But I also knew how to help people who were behind on their 
home who yeah. own their mortgage, help people whose cars may have gotten repossessed, help people understand how to clean up their credit. Then I had a whole new um, range of, of skills and knowledge I didn't have before. So I feel like a lot of times people are just, they just want the tips. But a lot yeah. of times I'm like, you should understand how I even got Like here. I literally, you earned those tips. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I mean, the fire to get these tips. <laughs> like <laughs> you, I, it's, I so resonate with so much of what you're mm-hmm. saying, especially as a business owner. And we have a lot of business owners in our community. And, mm-hmm. and I was even just reading this like wild long form piece about this Brooklyn ice cream shop that, you know, went under in flames after getting millions and millions of investment because they just always thought they could catch up, right? Like we have that business mindset, the big yeah. entrepreneur, the big unicorn, whatever. And you're just like, I, I can catch up. I'll make it next month. I'll, you know, I'll do it next time. So if you look back on, on that mindset, because now you are doing it right. Like your business is doing incredible things. Your, your life and your lifestyle is doing incredible things for your family. What was the jump there? Was it getting into the weeds? Like you said, you did with your grandfather. What, what helped you turn your own life into the life that you were advising your clients? Yeah, it was, um, it was, it was really that turning point with, with, with my grandfather and also being open with my mom about what I was going through. And, 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 and they shared with me financial struggles that they have gone through. Mm-hmm. Another reason that it took me so long to even ask anybody for help was because I felt like I was the only one. I was like, I'm the only one I'm the screw up, yeah. <laughs> like, you know? Yeah. And then they were like, no, we've gone through financial things too. Maybe we didn't share all the exacts of it because you were a child. And you were like, child. Yeah. Well, let me tell you about it. Yeah. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not the only person in the world. Cause when you're yeah. going through stuff, you always feel like you're the yeah. only person in the world. So I would say that was a big turning point for me. And it still took years to really kind of get out of, out of that hole and situation. Um, but after that, I knew I would never go back there again. Wow. And I just made a conscious effort to ensure that, you know, it was never, for, for me, it was never living beyond my means. Because as, as even that amount that I share with yeah. you was a huge amount. I've always lived within my means because I am, I am, I am, I am frugal. Um, but it was, it was then also making sure that I took my business seriously. You know, I took my business a lot more seriously. I didn't treat it like a hobby. I wasn't doing stuff for free. I wasn't giving yep. people discounts. I had to stick with it and be be concrete and said, look, I'm a, I'm a business owner. I'm building a business. If I didn't make that shift, you know, even a few years ago, I definitely wouldn't be where I am now. Now we have a, a thriving business. You know, financial worries are, are so, so far gone. Um, but I had to make that shift as, as, as an entrepreneur, but also as a woman, a lot of times yeah. as women, we are, Oh no, I'll give you a discount. I'll do this for free. Blah, blah, blah. Like, no, when these people go buy Beyonce tickets, they pay full price. When they right. go to Gucci, they pay full price. When they come to finances to mystify it, you are paying full price unless we're doing a sale <laughs> that we've already pre-authorized. And I had to, I had to treat yeah. it that because if not, people will, will take advantage of you. Yeah. So that was a major shift for me. It's, it's just, it's knowing your power, knowing your value and, and Mm -hmm. leaning into that. And it's, um, you know, even, even years into business ownership, which I, you know, also am, you know, five plus, oh my God, the years go by so fast. You continue to learn, you know, new layers of it because it's like, you get really good at owning your value in one place and then you do something new and it's like, you have to relearn it again. Yeah, what part yeah. of your work are you now at the place in your life that you're having to kind of refine and relearn? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I would say being a CEO, mm. being a CEO, I am, it's something I have been battling with, I would say, especially over the past, maybe like eight months where we had like this huge, just substantial growth and we grew fast. Revenue grew fast, yeah. but also when revenue grows, grows fast, your team has to grow a little bit faster. Um, I was basically a team of between one, me, one, yeah. to three contract, yeah. you know, two to three contractors throughout the years for the past probably six years. Yeah. Right. So I'm used, I am really good at sales. I'm good at marketing. I'm good at ads. I'm good at being the tech person. I'm good at being HR. I'm good at cleaning up the place. Right. Yeah not great at them because you can't be great at all those different things. So now one of the things I've been learning is how to outsource. I suck at outsourcing. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I suck at it. And also a shout out to like my husband who is the king of outsourcing who had to be like, you only have so much energy in a day. You know, now we have a daughter and, yeah. you know, we hope to grow our family even more one day. And he's like, you can't, you can't do it all. So that's something that I've been working on is, is, is outsourcing. I've gotten a lot better with it, especially the past couple of months. Cause I see the value of hiring people who are experts at what they do yep. because they can do it so much better and so much quicker than I can do it. Um, so that's something that I've, I've, I've had to learn even now, just, you know, having these conversations, we're going to have to like, you know, maybe possibly let some people go, you know, like all these different oh. things, like how do you have these conversations? Right. So that's something that I'm re re I don't know. So that's just a relearning, but having to get new knowledge. Yeah. Um, you go from business owner to CEO and parts of those are similar, but parts of those are, are very different. And yeah. okay. So you have mentioned your work, right? Like you are so anchored in helping all of us. And thank you for this <laughs> demystifying our finances, but Dominique, and can you indulge me in just explaining what that means and why, why it's important? Yeah. So I came up with the company name, uh, finances demystified. Cause I'm just like, Finances need to be demystified. And every time I see the word demystified, I'm thinking of that's something it. becoming clear, you yeah. know, something that's hazy, that's finally becoming clear. And so that's what we try to do. We try to make stuff, a lot of times concepts that are very complicated, very clear. It's important because um, the financial industry makes money when we don't know stuff. Mm-hmm. Okay. So as long as the financial services, banking, et cetera, industry can keep you hay in a haze, they can continue to charge you these fees. Because when you know better, hopefully you do better, right? So if more, um, if more people are aware of how their credit card works, right, they won't waste thousands of dollars letting their debt linger. If people understood how banks make money right? Maybe they will be smarter with maybe not necessarily leaving their money, just sitting in there earning 10 cents a month. If people understood inflation and how inflation works, they will understand why their money needs to earn at least 3% a year to even keep up, right? And not to be losing money. If people understood how simple it actually can be to invest in the stock market and have their money grow for them, they would do it. But a lot of times, especially, especially in the Black community, we don't talk about this. We're not exposed to it. And because people are so used to living paycheck to paycheck, mm-hmm. it's really hard to have a wealth building conversation with anyone when they're trying to get through next week, not just in the black community, but new all communities, right? Yeah. Um, people who aren't necessarily born into wealth, right? Yeah. So I think I know that if we can demystify the world of finances for people, it can change their lives, mm-hmm. it can change their families' lives. It can change their own personal lives and how they are, the, their quality of life, yeah. their health, just how they feel, their confidence, which will trickle down to their children or their nieces or their nephews or their loved ones or their friends or whatever it may be, just from a simple concept of finances. Because finances and money is one of the things that, believe it or not, all of us in the world have in common. Even if we're <laughs> right? not- using a currency back in the day, we had to barter, you know, Hey, Maxie, if you want me to do your hair, okay, that's fine. Then you're going to give me some business coach or whatever, yep. Barter, yep. right. Trading. So I think it's very important for people to understand just these basic economic principles, because for a lot of people, even if they're the first person in their family, and that this is uh, something I see a lot, a lot of times, um, especially minorities or even just women, they're the first person in their family to maybe make six figures or the first, you know, maybe, um, especially women, a lot of times are like, Hey, my mom always worked at home. So she doesn't necessarily, she can't provide any advice on how being, how it is to be a working mom and, or whatever it right. might be. They don't even know how to manage their money. Cause they're like, my mom's like, well, I never made it, you know, whatever the situation totally, is, totally. you know, or, or they're from other, you know, uh, other countries and, and things were different there. And they're like, wow, you know, I got this great job at Google or Twitter or whatever. And I'm making a hundred thousand, but what the hell do I do with it? Like, right. hundred <laughs> percent. What yeah. do I do with this? I've never had anyone do this. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. You have laid out so many things that I want to take each one of these yeah. brilliant rabbit holes uh, with you. They're not rabbit holes. They're like they're mind bending holes um, that I think <laughs> will will just improve all of our lives. But, you know, when you are talking about I remember, you know, as you're saying this, it's this one thing that we all we all have in common, which I don't think we really think about. And I was told once, you know, the exchange of money being paid for something is the exchange of gratitude. Like mm -hmm. you do a service for me. I am, this is like a way that I'm showing gratitude back. And, and so of energy money is energy. It's constant energy. Mm -hmm. And what I would love to understand from you of people who have never thought about the, um, the fact that it is energy and that, you know, we have money and, and understanding personal finance here. And then we have major social justice issues, whether it's gender issues, racial issues. Can you connect those two for me and why money is this bridge that can really start to create change in some of these, these social justice issues that we obviously care so much about? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's complex, right? Even, even, I'm trying to think where to, where to even begin. It's complex, right? It, it, it's one of those, it, it, it almost comes down to literally a simple statement of money makes the world go round. Yeah. Right. So if our dollars are being used, example, we have wars every couple of years or whatever, right? Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, our government funds these, these, these wars, right? And, you know, the puts all this money into our army and military da, 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 to go and go to these other countries and, and blow things up, blah, 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 right? Now imagine if we took some of that money, that money energy, and we put it into um, supporting women entrepreneurs, not mm -hmm. just women, just women entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. right? Or um, helping, in, helping um, victims of certain crimes to, to, to rebuild their lives mm -hmm. or helping prison inmates to get educated and turn their lives around. Right. Yeah. To me, that's how you link some of the, when I think about those social injustices, right. I still feel like some of the best entrepreneurs in the world are in prison. Amen to that. They were just a selling, woman to that. Yeah, they were just selling the wrong product. Yeah, they were just, yeah, we were just selling the wrong product. They were so selling true. Product that was illegal. My dad was in prison for the first five years of my life mm. because he was selling marijuana, something that I could go down the street right now and buy or get delivered. I think I could get to it you. I'm pretty sure you could. Yes, yeah. I think there's an app for that, yeah. right? Especially when I lived yes. in LA, there were stores all over. You can get flavors, you get gummies now. My dad was in prison for five years for that, right? He's a great entrepreneur now. He owns a limous limousine company. He was just yeah. selling the wrong product. Why was he selling the wrong product? Because of a lack of exposure mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. different types of things that he could sell. In his community where he was raised, which was in the hood in Maryland, that's what people did. Yeah. If they wanted to, you know what I mean? So to me, if we took some of this money and funding and things of that nature and, and, and used it to create programs, to solve yeah. problems, the world would be a better place. It really would. But yeah. we're taking our money and we're putting it into other things that aren't necessarily going well, to and money ready. staying in the, yeah. Money staying in the same hands too, yeah, right? Like it's, it's staying it's in the same right. white hands, the same yeah. white male billionaire hands. And it's like, you know, you look at that. We talk about this in San Francisco, obviously mm -hmm. with the venture capital, like mm -hmm. we look at how many black women are not, you know, have not raised over a million dollars. Like it's yeah. just as, and it's, you know, and it's, it's, that's, that's, it's, it's frustrating because it's actually, they have done studies and it's proven not just black women. I'll say yeah. women in general. Black women, that's a that's a whole nother issue, right? But different podcast episode. Yeah, this, yeah, but women in general have had higher success rates in business when they do receive funding and when they don't. One of the interesting things that happened even when I, I was sharing, um, you know, I had a I had a goal. We 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 did like 800 k in five months and then wow. just did a million in the past 30 days. And I was sharing this and, you know, we'll hit eight figures this year, a hundred percent owned. Yes. Woman. Yes. Company, right. Yeah. Company that has never raised any money. And then I, it's interesting. I started having all these like VC firms and stuff hitting me up on, on um, LinkedIn. 
I don't want anyone's money because I don't want to have to answer to anyone. But it's like as a black woman or as a woman, you have to go and prove on your own, Mm -hmm. make a few million before anyone will even talk to you. Mm -hmm. I even have friends. I have friends who are (laughs) white men. I have friends who are um, younger than me with way less experience who literally went to a VC with the idea on a piece of paper and said, this is an idea I have and literally walk away with, <laughs> with 3 million. They haven't so like, I had to make that 3 million before you would give me half. Literally, before even yeah. anyone would even look yeah. my way. Totally. And so that's a whole, that's a whole nother issue. Right. Yeah. And if, and if, and if women, if women and or women of color, black women specifically, mm-hmm. cause black women have it even harder than other women of color who may be Asian and et cetera, et cetera. Yep. If we're able to get the funding, right? Then we can put some of that money back into our communities and et cetera, et cetera. But even like myself, Adam don't want any funding. I'm gonna create an eight figure company and, and, and go on to, you know, to more, to more nine figures, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to do what I want to do without having to take the time and energy to beg people for money. Right. Use that time that I would typically, most people. Like I'm making it. it. I'm changing things and I'm making it. Yeah. yeah I'm going to put into it. So that's, I mean, it's going back to the social, the social and you know, how uh, social injustices and how those things tie to me. That's, that's it where it goes round. It all goes round. Our guests aren't the only ones who get to answer questions that they've never been asked. You can join in on all the fun. Go to womanoncollective.com backslash worksheet for questions you've never been asked. Because hey, newsflash, you don't need all the right answers. You need all the right questions. That's how you can take the inspiration from this episode and actualize it in your own life. So go on now. Questions for this episode that you've never been asked are waiting for you for free at womanoncollective.com backslash worksheet. I'm just imagining someone sitting in the shoes of, you know, maybe this was the past year that they first started their business. And then they hear, you know, you, you and I, we came into each other's worlds when we were at, you know, very different places in both of our pursuits and our businesses than we are today. And so much can happen Mm. in just a few years. And so much can happen in mindset shifts and doing the work that you are doing Mm. with your community and, and students. And so if someone is sitting listening to this and they've just started their side hustle or they they're dreaming of the day where they can make those eight figures in that amount of months, what allowed you to scale to that kind of business from a place of, you know, financial expertise and personal finance to like really becoming the CEO of a, you know, big number experience? Yeah, I think it was believing that I could. Yeah. And I know it sounds really simple and corny, but for a while, I knew I wanted, I had a vision of what I wanted the business to look like, but I think I realized, actually, I didn't, I don't think I realized this till last summer that I still have my own limiting beliefs. We all do. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was like, okay, I make a few hundred thousand a year. That's fine. Right. I'm comfortable. Yeah. But I never really deep down believed that I could create a multi-million dollar business in the world of personal finance, you know, and I remember my mentor, when I was quitting my job, my mentor telling me that I would never make any money helping people that didn't have money. And it pissed me off. And I was like, it only motivated me even more. Mm-hmm. But now that I think back, I think I believed that a little bit. Yeah. I think I did. And I was like, well, these people can't afford to pay me. And da, da, da. you know what I mean? All these yep these limiting beliefs sunk in. And it was honestly, I would say even my husband and we, we, we just got married in this last October, 2020. Um, but we've been together for a few years. He, a lot of times someone else will see in you what you don't see in yourself. Absolutely. There are mirrors. Yeah. And he was yeah. just like, what? You're amazing. You're going to have super multi-million. Like you are amazing. You are a genius. Look how many people you help. And I'm like, I don't know, you know? And he's just like, started really just kind of reinforcing a lot of that stuff, honestly. And that was to me when stuff just started taking off. I love that. I was launching a new program and I was like, oh, I want to, I want to charge this. And he's like, you're silly. No, 
you need to charge more. It's yeah. worth more. Look at the value. You're launching this program. You're teaching people how to make tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. You can't charge $500. You yeah. have to charge more, you know, literally. hundred yeah. percent. And I'm fighting him on it. And so that was like the big change for me. And I realized, and it was interesting. One of our students came to us and they were like, I've made like over a hundred thousand in the last three months with wow. the information that you gave me. They're like, you should charge more. And I'm like, no, no, no. Cause I said, you know, I'm still in, it's, we still battle with this now. And I'm like, no, I don't want to price people out because there's a certain audience I'm still trying to reach. But that was something that was major for me. And I've definitely realized that a lot of, especially women entrepreneurs, just women in general, we are just, we're softer, we're kinder, blah, blah, blah. Right. We're trying to help save the world, which is great. But a lot of times we don't price, price ourselves right because of that. And therefore we suffer financially. Um, I think I, I, I got to get this stat right. Cause I'm always talking about the stat, but it's not right. But um, <laughs> the, the average, I think it's the average uh, black um, entrepreneur does like 60,000 a year. Mm. The average female entrepreneur, race aside, does like 110,000 a year. Which seems like a lot, but yeah. it's not it's because not. that's gross before they pay for any, you know, all uh, the things. It, yeah. It's, it's pay, like yeah. less than 3% of female run businesses become seven figure businesses. Exactly. When I, whatever that stat is, we'll figure out what. Yeah. And I can't, but it, it's, but it's around that bar. Impose it over. Yeah, yeah. But it's either way, it's, it's ridiculous. And, you know, once, people, let's say, even if someone's making 60,000 a year, once they pay whatever else they need to pay, if they're selling t-shirts, half that may, may literally go to product, whatever, whatever, they're almost down, almost back down to close to minimum wage. Right. Right. That's sad. And it comes down to two things. And what as I realized, one, we don't focus as women, we don't focus on making, making sure that we're priced right and really capturing our value in this prices and two sales. People are scared to sell. So, if you're not sailing, you're failing. You can have the prettiest website in the world, the prettiest everything in the world, but if no one knows that you exist, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So women need to focus what I feel like a lot of times the, the job of a salesperson is frowned upon. Oh, it's a salesperson calling. But as entrepreneurs, we are salespeople. Yeah. yeah. And if you're not sailing, selling, sailing, selling, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. And that's, mm -hmm. and it's the job of a CEO, right? You, it you is. Need to be the best salesperson. But and that's even, the funniest, and that's one of the things I realized that's actually my favorite job in my business is selling. You're perfect for it. I love it. Like, I <laughs> love it. Like, that's for my it. favorite thing to do. Yeah. Well, and you do it in like anyone who follows you or watches your videos or reads mm -hmm. anything or listens to this, right? Like you sell by being who you are and being really passionate yeah. about how you're serving. And it's selling can be so heart centered. And so, you know, us in our power and doesn't have to be like, you know, the, the car salesman vibe, um, but, but, calling. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which like, you know, it's, um, but even, even as I, as I listen to you, you know, talking about that and what it means to, to be your best salesperson, whether you're a business owner or whether you're trying to get the promotion, you know, within the corporation or a workplace, like you owning what you are incredible at taking credit for it, being the own best, you know, salesperson of your skills. Like it, it serves you anywhere you go. If we can kind of step into that a little bit more. And one of the things that you were talking about in that, you know, that belief system of, you know, you having your partner and being able to do that, whether it's our peers, whether it's a coach or an advisor that we pay to get us believing bigger than the stats and the numbers and our own work, like, you know, what all of the patterns and origin stories in our brain. I think that also, right, plays into when we start to shift from like budgeting our life to building wealth mm -hmm. in our life. Can you talk to me for anyone who's listening and doesn't really know what that difference is? Like thinks like, oh, I want to make $150,000 this year. That would make me wealthy or, you know, whatever. What does it actually mean to build wealth versus to just want to make a number one day? Yeah, it's, it's very different. And uh, it's something, you know, our, our wealth has grown substantially over the past like year and a half. So it's, it's been like a shift, right? Where, like you said, previously, it's like, okay, I want to make 
10,000 a month and, and, and budgeting for that, um, it's a difference, right? So setting that goal and saying, I want to make this, because a lot of times, even with that number, you, you, you say that number, 5,000, 10,000, whatever, 20,000 a month, because you're really just trying, most of the time people are like, Actually, if I can just pay my bills, put a little money to the side, pay off some debt, yeah. and that's it. But that's not building wealth, right? That's really just maintaining yourself on a monthly basis. Yep. Keeping yourself up and running, maybe saving a few bucks, you know, 500, 500 bucks, and maybe paying off some de- debt. Once you get that number, then it's like, okay, what, do I, what is it going to take to build wealth? Then, then that's a whole other conversation. So it, is it fair to define wealth as when you start to shift into the mindset of using the money that you have to make you more money? Mm-hmm. So I think, I think wealth means something different to everyone. Okay. And that's great to know. But yeah. For me, originally, I would say, so there's, there's wealth, right? Feeling well, okay, there's there's creating wealth to me, creating wealth to me does go with hand in hand with being able to take assets and make more money. Right. Cause in the day people may act like you don't need it, but you do, you need money to live somewhere. Unless you're going to go completely off the grid and live in in the forest, which some people do, you need money. Okay. You even need money to go make that transition to go live in the forest to buy the tent, et cetera. cetera. But then there's also feeling wealthy. I've always felt wealthy. Right. And I didn't grow up poor. I'm not going to claim that. I grew up very middle class. Like I went to private school, blah, blah, blah. Right. I did grow up middle class, but I've always felt wealthy and I have always felt wealthy. I feel even wealthier now, not because of the money that we have, but because I've always had a loving family. I always had amazing friends. Now I have this awesome husband. I have a beautiful daughter. I'm healthy. Those things make me feel wealthy. So I've always felt wealthy, even when my bank account said negative otherwise. <laughs> I hear that. I hear <laughs> that. I always felt wealthy. So I think that's important for you to understand because there's a lot of people who have a lot of wealth, but are mm-hmm. unhappy and don't feel wealthy. You know, and so a lot of times people, you know, you'll see, oh, this multimillionaire, billionaire committed suicide, blah, blah, blah. Well, it could be one, they just weren't happy. Because money does not equal, it helps. Mm -hmm. Trust me, it helps. I ain't gonna lie, it definitely helps. But it does not equal Mm -hmm. happiness or they could have been dealing with some mental issues as well, right? So I think it's very important for people to understand the difference between the two because I've always felt wealthy. You couldn't tell me otherwise. I was talking to my little sister the other day. She's like, I always thought we were rich growing up. I always thought we were rich. I'm like, well, we were okay, but we weren't. I was totally there, (laughs) yeah. But that's just because that was the energy that we put out. Yeah. If someone is listening to you, Dominique, and they're like, I I don't feel wealthy and I'm also not building wealth. What is like one or two things they can do to start to shift that? Is it education? Is it self-talk? Is it like, where do you begin? If you're like, I know that I'm not where you're describing. So how do I get there? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I think when the first part, feeling wealthy starts with you right? No one's going to come along and make you feel, you know, people like, oh, if I just get the right partner, get rights in it, you know, mate. No, you have to feel happy and wealthy and happy with yourself. So I would say, take, I like to say a, 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 a inventory of what you do have. Last night I laid in bed and I was just like, wow, my bed is comfortable. I feel so blessed to have a warm home you know, I know what people are dealing with in Houston right now and all these, like those things I literally take inventory of. I, we, my husband, we do this too. We do gratitude sessions in the morning, not every single morning, but most mornings. People act like we do stuff every morning. Not everyone does it, but most mornings <laughs> we get up and we're like, oh, he'll just say, I'm so grateful for you. I'm mm-hmm. grateful for the fact that we have orange juice in the refrigerator. I'm grateful, like literally. And I think a lot of times if you literally just stop and think about what you're grateful for that you already have that may not necessarily be physical things. I am grateful for the fact that I haven't caught COVID. Like yeah. I feel yeah. well, like, because of that, that makes me feel happy, healthy, wealthy. So I think that's what people need to first start. If they don't feel wealthy within their yep. self, take inventory of what you do have. Cause the things that you do have are priceless. Mm-hmm. Your health, you cannot buy better health. They say you can't, but you can't, you yeah. can't. Right. Um, then I would say, if you don't feel wealthy financially, see why take a financial inventory of where you are currently financially. How much money are you bringing in? Are you overspending? Are you, are you using that money that you have to, 
to to um to grow are you using it to grow if you feel like you're not well let's 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 work out a plan how much are you bringing in what are your expenses where's the difference are you putting money aside for yourself are you making yourself a priority financially mm. are you taking some time maybe taking a hundred dollars a month and investing it so that it can grow yeah. are you taking a hundred and putting it aside to savings a lot of times people Feel like they're not doing well financially, but a lot of times I realize they're not taking any steps whatsoever to even get themselves in that situation. And don't feel like you need hundreds of thousands, millions of billions of dollars to do this. You can literally start saving with as little as what five dollars, yeah. a dollar, yeah. right? You can start investing with as little as five dollars. Yeah. So don't also delay these things and delay the wealth building process because you don't feel like you have enough money. Hundred percent. People do it. So just take one step today, take a financial it's, inventory of what you have. Yeah. I'm, I'm so appreciative of that, both of taking inventory and then just taking action. Like inventory does show you, it's either kind of like you said, how you started this. It's not that deep or it's not yeah. that bad. Um, or it's like kind of better than I thought. I think I might actually have more money than I thought I did. And then also, <laughs> yeah, yeah. To go from that to like taking a little bit of action anywhere that we are, because I think that does put you into a mindset too. Even if you're investing $5, you're an investor. Like you have now yeah, moved into a new <laughs> identity and actually moving into a new identity with money is something that I want to ask you about, because I know you just mentioned you recently had your daughter, um, and you're building this family and your family will potentially continue to grow. And I think as women, whether we're planning on having children or not, this is something that we are taught to, you know, think about the time that we'll either be on mat leave or we'll be in, you know, in partnership and our, our life is changing. How did your relationship to money shift as your life shifted, as you became married, as you became a mother, like what new things um, do we need to think about as, as those transitions are happening from us, from your personal experience? Yeah, I would say there's, there's a lot of little things you want to think about. Um, definitely like the life insurance piece, right? Um, I, I already had life insurance just because I'm a financial planner, right? So I have I had life insurance for a long time, but as soon as we, you know, we found out I was, I was pregnant, I increased my life insurance policy, right? Because I knew that now it's not just me just having insurance, just, you know, to cover little things. Now I, there's a whole person that's sure. coming <laughs> that could be, yeah, dependent on me. So that was one step I took. I increased my life insurance. My husband increased his life insurance. Um, and then even little things like I got a will, right? I didn't, I didn't have a will in place. I got a will in place. And now some of the things we're thinking about now, we, we were meeting with an attorney recently, we're getting tr a trust put in place. So, you know, we've been able to accumulate some wealth for her over the first year. She works for us. She makes money, um, yeah. she has 16 months, but she's, she's a brand ambassador of the company. Um, so we want to make sure that if something happens to us, she's fine. And that some little, you know, a little, a little boy doesn't come along one day and try to take her little money or whatever. <laughs> so, so things like that, we're literally putting in place, um, you know, in, in the event that something happens to, to me and to me and my husband, who takes, mm -hmm. who takes our daughter, you know what I mean? Yeah. These are the conversations that you don't want to have the, the things we had to put in place that affect her, that could affect her life and affect her financially. Um, you know, making sure she has investment accounts, like all those different types of things. And then also making sure that our beneficiaries are updated. Now I'm adding my husband, you know, before, you know, when you're younger, everything is like your mom or your dad or whoever, right? Um, now I'm switching some of that stuff and it's it's my my husband and my daughter. So all those are all the things that I had to, to change because now there's these new humans that are a part of my life that weren't before. Right. Um, so those are some of the things that, and it's choosing. Yeah. It sounds like, you know, what you're saying too, is like, it's choosing to do things differently, to look at what needs to be done differently with mm -hmm. the new phase of life that you're in. And, yeah. and I think that's true for all of us, whether it's family planning or partnership or starting a business, it's different chapters of our lives require different things. And like, yeah. we either choose, you know, to grow with that or, or not. I would love to do a quick rapid fire of some of the questions that we got from our community. Um, and just to hear a little bit about like what you would tell them because we need to know. All right. Ashley says, what do I need to do if I want to start the home buying process? Can I even think about buying a home if I have student loan debt? Mm, good question. Um, yes, you can. I bought my first house. When I was 22. I was still in college. 
Um, I think a lot of times it's actually better to buy a house when you're you're not making, you know, tons and tons of income just yet, you know. So I was able to, um, I'll just like share with you really quickly my personal story. I was able to use a first-time home buyers program based on my lower income because I was still in college, which made me eligible for more programs, right? So because of that, I was able to purchase a home that, you know, uh, that was discounted because I was quote unquote, quote unquote lower income, right? So I think this is a great time, even with debt, student debt, don't let your student loan debt hold you back. Look around. There's really great um, first time home buyer programs. I, at the time, lived in Maryland. So you could literally Google Maryland first time home buyer programs or DC first time home buyer programs or California first time home buyer programs. There's a lot of great programs out there that will literally help you with your down payment. They will help you. Um, with closing costs, they will sometimes even uh, give you the ability to purchase units that may be priced higher, but they'll price some at what they call a, a moderate price for lower, quote unquote, lower income. Um, so I would say go for it. I would say go for it. Look for, like I said, just start looking for your state or I was very specific. I was able to start Googling the county I wanted to live in. I lived in Montgomery County. Montgomery County first time home buyer programs. There's also uh, another great organization called NACA, NACA.org. It's a nonprofit that's countrywide. They also help first time home buyer programs with the step by step process, you know, looking at your budget, getting a pre approval, um, and seeing what you're eligible for, because that's the first step, um, and then helping you to get a home with no down payment. So I would say if it's something that you're passionate about, Go for it. Just start looking for first-time homebuyer programs and definitely check out NACA. I think it's NACA.org. Yeah, that is, that's awesome. And I feel like so many people just don't realize that there are resources here that help you, especially when you're doing this for the first time. A lot of our community has asked questions about a lot of what you've referenced in terms of family and upbringing. So Katie wanted to know, how do you start to teach kids about money? Mm, I think, yeah, that's a good question. So um I, I think it's very important to have the conversations. Simple as that. I think that was one of the best things that my mom did for me was talking about money. I mean, literally as simple as this is what a credit card is. You know what I mean? Like, and not in like a lesson way, but you know, oh, look, mommy's going to use your credit card to pay for this. But mm -hmm. mommy has to make sure she pays it off at the end of the month. Why? Because there's this thing called interest. What's it like? It literally just sparks yep. the conversation for a lot of people. They just don't talk about it at all. So I would say just start having the conversation, involve your child in your financial decisions, not tough ones. Like, you know, <laughs> but like yeah. involve them in your financial position, in your financial uh, uh, conversations. And it makes them feel one, a part of the household, but yeah. also that Finances is just something that we talk about. It's something that's a part of our lives. Um, and I will also say, start getting and building investments for your child, for your children early. So I started building investments for, for my daughter early. She can't pick her investments, but one of the things I also did for my little sister, cause she's 17 years younger than me, when she got a little bit older, when she was like seven or eight, I would say, what companies do you want to invest in? In, in her stock portfolio, she would pick them. So back then it was like Disney and McDonald's and stuff like yeah. that. Now she's like 19, whatever. But that's what she would do. So she was very um, excited about it. And she wanted to check her portfolio because she was investing in companies that she used. Yeah, that's awesome. It's um, It also is, it's like normalizing yeah. so much of the conversation. And yeah. on the flip side of that, like we have control of that. What about... And this is a question specifically from Nicole. She asked, how do we deal with personal finances as an adult when you come from a family that never discussed finances, even after losing everything? So, you know, Nicole has had the opposite experience to what it sounds like Dominique, you had growing up. So how do we start to shift those in our own current family dynamics and within ourselves? That's major. So I think, and that's, you, I hear that a lot more than the, my story. I hear that, that story is more, more often. Um, I would say you have to, you have to make a decision. You, you literally have to make a decision. The, the change, <laughs> the change starts with you. It does. Yeah. You literally have to make a decision that you want to change this, um, you know, how things have been in your family. So for a lot of people, that means like they may go and seek a financial planner or a financial advisor and get this financial guidance. Um, and then they're coming back a lot of times and relaying it to their family and saying, hey, this is what I learned. This is what I'm implementing in, in my life. 
I'd love to help you with it if, if you would allow, but you have to literally say, look, I'm going to, I want, I want to, I want to change my financial situation. I want my family or whoever in my life for this to be different for us. And it literally has to start with you. That's, that's really what it boils down to. So last question, which is Sierra wants to know, can you explain short and long-term capital gains? Yes, 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 yes. So people are really confused about our capital gains, I realize. So, but if you are starting to trade and invest, capital gains are actually very, very important to understand, right? So essentially what short-term capital gains are is when you own an asset. So let's, typically it's gonna be like a stock, right? Or, or some sort of investment. Um, short-term capital gains taxes when you own an asset for less than a year, okay? So let's say if as I do day trading, right? So let's say if I buy some Apple stock today um, and I sell it uh, next week, right? And I make $1,000. Because I held this stock for less than a year, I have to pay what they call a short-term capital gains tax. Now, that's not a set rate, that rate is based on your ordinary income tax bracket, right? Which can usually mm -hmm. be anywhere between 0% to like as high as 37%, right? Depending on your, yeah. your ordinary, uh, your ordinary, ordinary income tax bracket. Um, and then uh, there's what we call long-term capital gains, right? So people are always like, oh, hold your investment for a year and a day because then you don't have to worry about short-term capital gains. You only have to pay long-term capital gains, right? So long-term capital gains is like I said, when you hold um, you know, an asset or hold, let's say an investment yeah. for a year and a day for more than a year, okay? Yeah. So that's why sometimes people literally say a year and a day. When you do that, the tax rate, um, the long-term uh, long-term capital gains tax rate is between is usually 0%, 15% or 20%, right? Depending on um, like your, your income, mm -hmm. your filing status, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So as you can see, it can be much lower um, depending on your, your tax status. So that's yeah. basically what capital gains taxes. And hopefully that makes sense. It makes so much sense. And it's just knowing too, right. That this mm -hmm. exists as you kind of step into this new part of your finances, or if it's new for others, or if to your, you know, knowledge set of telling us to actually know what's going on with our finances, yeah. those things are going on. Um, Dominique, this has been so eye opening, so helpful on a soul level, on a tactical level. Thank you so much for giving us your stories, your advice, your wisdom. Before I let you go, though, I need to know what are you batshit grateful for? Oh, so much. I, I honestly would just say my family. Yeah. My family, my, 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 my parents and stuff like that. But I would say right now, just really grateful for my husband and, and my daughter. And I've always been like, I was the only child, yeah. you know, uh, for most of my life, I've been single, you know, entrepreneur floating around the world. And I was always kind of scared of the whole family life. But now that I have it, I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful. Beautiful. So grateful for them every day. Yeah. So special. Well, we are grateful for you. Thank you, Dominique. Thank you for having me.